Hello and welcome to our webinar on uh, the National Law Center's uh, on Homelessness and Poverty's new report, Tent City, USA, The Growth of America's Homeless Encampments and How Communities Are Responding. I'm Eric Tars, Senior Attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, um, and I'd like to point out up at the top of our screen um, our social media handles. We are live tweeting throughout this event. So if and when our presenters say brilliant things, uh, please do feel free to tweet about it and share it with the broader audience. Um, in terms of our presenters, we do have a great set of panelists lined up today, uh, representing a very wide range of experiences from people who have lived in encampments to public officials who have attempted to constructively address them, <clears throat> to those who have helped to design them, and those who have helped to defend them. A quick housekeeping note, because of the large number of people on the webinar, we have participants lines muted, but you can type questions into the question box on the side of your screen at any point, and at the end, we'll read as many as we can and try to answer them. You can also click on the raise your hand button at the end, and we'll see if the technology allows us uh, to ask your question verbally. But the best way at any point, as I said, you can type your question into the box, and we will try to answer at them at the end. But before we get going, um, we're going to do a quick couple of polls just to see where people are coming from. Um, first is, uh, what is your engagement? How do you engage with uh, uh, homelessness, uh, homeless encampments in your community? We recognize that you may have more than one answer for this, but just trying to get a sense of who's on the call today. All right, I'll give you five more seconds to put in your answers. All right, thank you for that. It looks like we have a, a very good mix of government officials, legal advocates, other advocates, and service providers. So uh, again, a very wide range of people on the webinar itself. Um, moving on. Are, uh, we're just wondering, are there homeless encampments in your community right now that you are concerned about? We'll leave this up. For another second or two. All right. And it looks like for the vast majority of you, there are Having a little technical difficulty sharing the results, but it looks like about uh, half of you said, yes, there are many in your community, and another third said at least a few. So the question is, are you then looking for constructive solutions to those encampments? This should be a fairly easy question for people on this, uh, on this webinar. Um, but uh, just want to represent uh, that 
there are many people out there who are looking for better solutions than what we have now. And leave that up for a couple more seconds. All right. And it looks like overwhelmingly 98% said, yes, you are looking for constructive solutions. So thanks for engaging in that. Um, now uh, we'll go on. We at the National Law Center do believe that it's important to take a human rights uh, focused approach to our work. Um, and I'd like to introduce Maurice Young, a self-described homeless, homeless advocate who lives in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, by being a homeless, uh, a human rights organization, we believe that we must be, have our work centered on and led by the voices of those who are directly affected by the rights violations that we're working to remedy. Um, let me make sure I can unmute Maurice here. That's okay. Um, like as introduced, my name is Marie Young. I am a homeless, homeless advocate here in the city of Indianapolis. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the plight of homeless people. Uh, I recognized earlier as we were talking, people are coming from different locations. So I will, I will usually be um, concentrating specifically on the Midwest and um, how things are happening here in the city of Indianapolis, um, regarding, of course, the plight. Of the of the homeless community, um, it's a situation that's it's really surreal for anybody who's never experienced homelessness, um, because you have individuals who are trying to conduct business or live a life outside of a home, and that usually you know exists in a tent community like we're talking about, um, or under a bridge or in a car or what have you, and um, in our city. Uh, things become very challenging um, when uh, the powers that be are, are really working against what these individuals are trying to accomplish. Um, and as one of the things Eric and I talked about earlier in the week is, you know, a situation where um, when you sleep outside, you never know who is going to approach you. Will it be somebody with bad intentions or will it just be the police moving you along? Um, and you have to, you know, exist in your space with that hanging over your head, not knowing. So you're technically not getting enough sleep. And then the sad part about that is after you are up for the day and move to your next location, there's places like the library, for example, that when you go there and fall asleep, uh, they are putting you out because they have policies in place where you can't come and sleep and rest. Um, and then for other people, you know, who have to do things like, um, a lot of people look for jobs and, and whatnot, but just the availability, being available to receive those contacts, you have to be in the library to check your emails and so forth. They have pay phones at the Greyhound bus station. Um, just, just the whole lifestyle in and of itself is very, very challenging. Um, so as a result of that, um, and I apologize for any background noise because I'm having this conversation in the public library. Um, uh, it just becomes complicated. And then while you're trying to work to get yourself out of homelessness, you look for allies like the city or service providers. And, they, and let me start with the service providers. They seem to be limited to how they can help you, especially in our city, if the city's not on board with the overall support of the, of the process of helping homeless people move themselves um, out of their situation. So um, that's kind of what I can say a little bit about people who are impacted by homelessness, uh, uh, the growth of encampment. Um, I find personally it very interesting when we have the conversation about encampments, the conversation, the, the conversation about what births the encampments never come up. Because in our city, the lack of housing, the lack of capacity, uh, the lack of services, this is what creates, you know, a good part of our encampments because people have to be somewhere until they can transition into housing. 
And um, as of, I believe it was last year when HUD decided not or to stop funding transitional housing, that really put us in a situation because we have waiting lists on both sides of our housing authority agencies from the COC side to the Indianapolis Housing Authority side. But nobody asked the question, where are the people going to be while they are on house, the waiting list, if you will. So this, I think, contributes a great deal for us in Indianapolis to the encampments because people have to be somewhere. They have to exist somewhere. And unfortunately, every time it starts to build up an encampment of sorts, then we have issues with the, the size of the camp or the encampment, and then we're moved. Um, and that's never the solution because we then just, it then just grows in another part or another place within the city. So we're just basically moving from space to space um, until, and for most people, like I said, who are on housing lists, until their names come up or until, until services are rendered to those individuals. And without that, that transitional piece anymore, we will lose even more in 2018. So I foresee our encampment situation in Indianapolis growing even more. Um, so one of the things that we do, we have to advocate against that um and on our end that means you know whenever the city creates whatever types of sweeps they want to do in the name of csx which is the training organization or homeland security we have to push back legally because if they take the public spaces away i don't know where we can exist after that so that's one of the things we have to continue to push back on until we can get a system in place and in play that's beneficial for everybody that's in the process I wanted to emphasize that while Maurice's story is just one story, it's one that is repeated across the country. Based on the reports that we've received, uh, we felt that the number of encampments was growing. But when many encampments are designed not to be found and many more are swept almost as quickly as they pop up, we tried to figure out how we could measure that. And we decided that the best we could do was to look at the media reports of encampments as a proxy. With pro bono support of partner law firms, we searched media reports over the past 10 years. The full methodology is described in our report, and we acknowledge that it's an imperfect proxy at best, but we do feel that the overall trend data is valid and important. And it does reflect that, even though it does reflect what we've been seeing all along, the data itself is stunning. We found a whopping 1,342% increase in the number of unique homeless encampments reported in the media. And the trend is continuing. Based on the partial year data that we have for 2017, we found almost as many encampments just up through the middle of this year as were reported in all of 2016. Uh, so we think this arc is gonna continue going upward. Uh, and these encampments are everywhere. We found over 1,300 unique encampments reported in every state over the past 10 years, um, with California having the most number by far, but states as diverse as Iowa, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, Oregon, and Virginia, each reporting many encampments. These encampments are large and growing larger. More than half the reports recorded the size of, that reported the size of the encampments showed a size of 11 to 50 residents and 17% of the encampments had more than 100 residents. Now, while we recognize that larger encampments are obviously likely to garner more press coverage, these figures suggest that there are, in fact, high numbers of both medium and large encampments across the country, in addition to the many smaller ones that never even make it into the media. These encampments are becoming semi-permanent features of our cities. Close to two-thirds of the reports which recorded the time and existence of the encampments showed they had been there for more than one year, and more than a quarter of them had been there for more than five years. This should be a very concerning statement for all of us. However, these encampments are under constant threat of eviction. Most are not sanctioned, and three-quarters of the, the reports which recorded the legal status of the encampments showed that they were illegal, and only 4% were shown to be legal, and about 20% had some sort of tacit tolerance, but no uh, firm pr 
protections under law. Cities are responding to the growth of encampments, but far too few are providing constructive approaches. Most, in fact, do not require any notice before they sweep or any storage of belongings if people are out while a sweep happens, and only a handful actually provide an offer of alternative housing or shelter. We'll hear some more about uh, some of the legal requirements later in the program from Carol Sobel, a, legal, a leading attorney bringing in many of the cases that have established the basic due process rights for people living in encampments or their vehicles. Instead, we see many communities who are responding by simply trying to make it impossible for homeless persons to shelter themselves, even as these Denver police did, ripping the blankets off of campers in the middle of winter. In fact, an increasing number of cities criminalize camping, making it illegal for homeless persons to shelter themselves, but not necessarily providing them adequate alternatives or even telling them where they might be able to go instead. The criminalization approach is expensive. Cities are spending millions of dollars each year between police time, jail costs, and sanitation efforts. And as we'll hear from Major Stiver later, this puts both law enforcement and homeless residents at risk and decreases rather than increases public safety. Moreover, as homeless individuals uh, get moved around from site to site, they often lose their IDs, their uh, mementos of their, their more stable life existence, medical supplies, all things that are necessary to them to stabilize their lives and get out of homelessness. So moving an encampment without providing for the needs of the people who live there actually prolongs homelessness and encourages the occurrence of the next encampment. Moreover, criminalization doesn't work especially when there isn't enough housing or even shelter accessible to people. Often when law enforcement tells residents of encampments to go to a shelter, they risk finding the shelter full. And even where the shelter beds are, there are open, they aren't always appropriate or even adequate for all people. People experiencing homelessness learn that while shelters may exist, they're not really accessible to them so they no more choose to live in an encampment than a person in a wheelchair chooses not to go into a building that only has stairs to the front door. Yes, it might not be inaccessible to most of us, but to them, it's not a real choice. In fact, the most important choices have already been made for them. These are the choices that saw federal affordable housing funding fall by more than 50% from its high in 1978 and has never been made up at the state or local level since. In places like California, they've known for decades that they've needed to be investing in hundreds of thousands of more affordable housing units each year, but instead they've been putting on board just a few thousand, and the result is that people are squeezed until they can be squeezed no more and end up on the sidewalks of Los Angeles, of San Francisco, and of other cities and towns across California. However, there are better practices out there. In 2015, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness issued a report setting out best practice procedures for ending homelessness for people living in encampments. The best way, because it makes sure that an encampment is closed permanently by housing all the people who needed it and making sure that they have an adequate alternative place to go. We've built on the U.S. Interagency Council's guidance with six new principles and accompanying practices developed through our interviews with government officials, advocates, service providers, and people who live in encampments. The most important of these is that as human beings, we all need a safe, accessible, legal place to be both day and night and to securely store our belongings until permanent housing is found. We emphasize with these recommendations that we do not accept that homeless encampments should become permanent features of American cities. We can and we must do better by our fellow citizens than to let them live in shanty towns on the peripheries of our cities. So the first commitment should be to finding permanent solutions. But that said, until those solutions are in place, cities should find ways of ensuring that everyone has access to the basic elements they need to survive with dignity. Second, these approaches need to be guided by those directly affected by them. 
People living in encampments have been improvising their own solutions for decades. Rather than imposing top-down approaches that meet the needs of the elected officials or those not living in the encampments and then forcing the people living there to comply, communities should look to the expertise of those living in encampments and work with them to develop solutions that will work for all. And that's with an emphasis on a very inclusive definition of all. Third, we know that encampments can't be permanent features of our cities, but moving people without a plan only makes things worse and moves the problem elsewhere. Charleston, South Carolina, which has a case study in our report, removed a 100 person encampment without a single arrest and put many of its message, uh, uh, residents into permanent housing uh, because they had an engagement with the community and made a clear plan in consultation with them. Clear procedures protect the interests of homeless persons, law enforcement, service providers, and other city residents alike. Fourth, while we do not want encampments to become permanent features of cities, we do recognize that they may play a temporary role in improving the living conditions for those living on the streets and preventing them from being further criminalized. For cities considering legalizing encampments, we set forth several considerations for ensuring it is in close, as close as possible to fully adequate housing. And we'll hear more later from Nicole about how they've done that in Las Cruces. Fifth, when homeless individuals are transitioned out of encampments, they can't be told simply, there's a mat on the floor for you somewhere. If that mat on the floor is not appropriate, for example, for a domestic violence survivor concerned about her safety. Alternatives to encampments must be real alternatives, allowing people to bring their pets, possessions, and partners to a safe, habitable, affordable, and accessible place, whether it's temporary shelter or permanent housing. Last, while we believe the existence of encampments is a social service issue, not a criminal justice one, law enforcement does have a role to play but it should be one that supports the needs of all members of the community, housed and unhoused. And again, we'll hear more about this later from Major Stiver. As I noted, our report also covers case studies of cities that have taken good approaches to existing encampments and those who are looking to integrate them as part of a comprehensive approach to ending homelessness. We don't have time to hear about all of them on the webinar, but you'll hear a little bit about some of them from the other speakers. I encourage people looking for inspiration to look at our report and for the details of what these cities did, how they got it done, and to see how uh, you might be able to do it in your own community. With each case study, we measure the practices against our principles and show how they measure up as a shorthand, as well as going in depth with what the policies were and how they were developed. Our report also covers federal and state law related to encampments. At the federal level, an increasing number of courts are applying the first, fourth, fifth, eighth, and 14th amendments to protect the rights of homeless individuals to survive in public. And at the state level, uh, lawyers have been using precedents involving principles of estoppel, unclean hands, and necessity to, uh, to add to some of the federal protections. Additionally, we review recent international human rights law developments on the right to adequate housing and prohibitions on criminalization of homelessness, which can provide useful lessons for governments struggling to deal with growing homelessness and encampments here. The U.S. has lost its position as a, as a shining city on a hill, as a beacon of human rights for other countries. But we can start to bring that back by beginning with the most marginalized in our communities, those who are forced to live in encampments. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to a presentation from Seattle City Council Member, Mike O'Brien. The council member had travel commitments, but he wanted to be part of this discussion. So we have a recorded message from him, uh, and he wants me to reaffirm that he's open to questions, and his legislative aide, Jesse Rollins, whose contact information is here, also put in a lot of work on the policies that he discusses, and is happy to help as well. So with that,
Um, I've been a city council member for eight years. Um, my background is more from the environmental field. I've been a volunteer at the Sierra Club for years. But when I came on to the city council in 2010, in the midst of a recession, we were seeing a crisis in our city, just like everywhere across the country, where people were struggling to make ends meet, and we saw an increase in homelessness. Um, the, the way I engaged in that was starting by working with people that were living in vehicles, as we were seeing more and more people move into their vehicles as an alternative when they lost their housing. And that's an area that I've engaged in, working on some local programs that have had some success. What I expected to happen in the years after I started on council, as we switched from a recession to a massive economic boom in Seattle, was that that problem would diminish. Um, what we've seen in the last 10 years in Seattle, and frankly, cities up and down the West Coast, is that with the economic boom has come a significant increase in homelessness, despite the good times. The growing income inequality, a whole host of other challenges, has resulted in what I think we've all seen in our cities is more and more homeless people. The National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty's data seems to represent, uh, seems to tell us that same stuff, same information. And well, frankly, when you're driving through, whether it's my city or any other city, it's hard not to notice um, both the tower cranes and the boom times that are happening, yet more and more people appear to be sleeping under bridges. The city of Seattle, uh, last year when we did our one night count, we had over about 8,500 people that were experiencing homelessness, um, and about 4,000 of those people that were living without any shelter at all. In the city of Seattle, uh, there really is nowhere it's legal for you to sleep outdoors. And so if you're one of those 4,000 people without shelter, um, wherever you end up, whether it's under a bridge, in a park, in a green belt, in someone's doorway, um, you're likely breaking one of the cities. So what's our solution to that? Um, frankly, we know it doesn't make sense for us to go out and arrest 4,000 people simply because they're sleeping outdoors because they have no resources to get anywhere else. Um, we don't have the resources to do that. We don't have the jail space to put them in. It doesn't make a policy sense. At the same time, we don't do anything to provide any clarity for where those 4,000 people should be. So that means every single night, these 4,000 people that are sleeping outdoors in the city of Seattle don't know if tonight is the night that the police are going to come knocking and say, hey, you can't be here. You need to move to somewhere else. And if you don't move, we're going to arrest you. Now, we don't arrest people in the city of Seattle, but we do move them along a lot. And how do we pick who gets moved and who doesn't? And where are they expected to go when we move them is one of the kind of perpetual challenges that we've struggled with. So a little over a year ago, a number of advocates in the city of Seattle, including um, the ACLU, um, Defenders associations that work with the homeless population and other homeless advocates came together and worked with myself and others to create some new legislation that would provide some clarity um, about where people were allowed to sleep or where they weren't allowed to sleep and what our process was to transition folks off the streets um, back into permanent housing. So I want to be really clear here. Um, it's not acceptable that anyone is sleeping out not acceptable, certainly in a city like Seattle, where we're creating massive amounts of wealth, that we still have thousands of people that are sleeping out there. We, it's inhumane, um, and we have to do a better job in society to make sure that everyone has access to a reasonable amount of sleep. Um, and the reality in Seattle, when you have 4,000 people at the moment that are sleeping outdoors, is that it's going to take some time to get that housing and get those systems in place. So we also need to have some structure around how do we address the immediate challenges? The immediate challenges to businesses and residents who are really uncomfortable or their life is disrupted by people living outdoors, and more importantly, to the individuals that are actually struggling with whatever the crisis is that causes them to be outdoors, whether that's just severe poverty, mental health issues, addiction issues, whatever that is. So the legislation that we came up with, um, the concept was that we would identify different places outdoors and categorize them. Um, if you're in an unsafe or an unsuitable location, so this could be an unsafe location, maybe you're camping on the edge of a freeway where there's no barrier, and so all a driver has to do is accidentally swerve and they may kill you. That actually happened last year. We could categorize that as an unsafe place, and we would move you immediately because it's just too hazardous to be there. An unsuitable location, if you're camping on the pitching mound of the kids' little league ballpark 
and they're out there playing games, you know, we're going to move you immediately. You know, the kids, this is a ballpark for kids to play ball on. You can't be on the pitcher's mound. Um, if you're in a hazardous situation, so this is where it's not quite the same imminent threat we talked about, but maybe there's public health issues where there's garbage accumulating or there's a rodent infestation or there's something unsafe around the hillside or something like that, some sort of hazard, we would have given you three days and the resources to remedy that. So let's pick up the trash, let's see if we can catch some of the roads, whatever the issue was. But there's some short time period to see if we can remedy it. And if for whatever reason we can't, then that location will also be deemed um, no longer suitable. In all the other areas in the city that are public areas that are outside of the unsafe, unsuitable, or hazardous location, we had a much higher standard before we moved them. And so this is saying, hey, you're in a green belt, you're on the edge of um, a park, you're under a freeway, you're not in the way of disturbing anybody, you shouldn't be out here because you should be indoors. But our responsibility as a society at that point is not to say you can't be here, but to start offering you better opportunities. And those better opportunities, uh, what we talked about in the legislation was, we need 30 days of engagement. You know, someone walks up to an individual who's been living outdoors for a couple of years, you can't expect them to make an offer and have them accept that within five minutes. And if they don't, say they're service resistant or they're denying it. We need to make a concerted effort over a period of time to build a relationship to understand what their specific needs are and provide um, affordable and accessible housing for that individual's needs. Um, what we know is that if you take the time to engage with individuals and provide them good alternatives, the vast majority of folks want to be indoors and living. And in the rare instances where someone is in some sort of other crisis and refuses to take it, our law would say at the end of that 30 days of engagement, you could say you're no longer allowed to be Legislation, frankly, when I talk about it again, and it's been a while since I've talked about it, um, sounds really reasonable again to me, and yet we couldn't get this up for even a vote in a committee because it was very controversial. And I want to talk a bit about the controversy around it. A lot of the controversy comes around the framing of this. Because, well, we weren't talking about, nothing I said there was it's legal to camp in parks or it's legal to camp in sidewalks or under bridges. But it said, look, we're not going to move people until we provide them alternatives. But what the press asks or community members ask is like, so what you're saying is someone can just camp in the park and you're not going to move them. And the answer is, well, if they're in a place that's not disturbing too many people, yes, they're going to be somewhere in our city. It's how we can provide them the affordable housing. But when the public narrative is around, you're legalizing camping in city parks for homeless people. But I can't go out there with my family and camp in the park. It's illegal. But someone who's homeless is allowed to do that that narrative starts to spin out of control. And what we found last year as well, the elected officials understood the dynamic and generally were willing to do something. The public narrative was so damaging around that, especially the short sound bites that tend to play on the evening news, um, that we ran into a political problem that we couldn't overcome. Um, the problem, of course, didn't go away. The legislation went away. And we still, now we have more than 4,000 people living outdoors. We still chase them around. We, you know, probably can only move, you know, two or three encampments. The vast majority of people aren't being touched, but they're constantly living in fear that am I going to get moved today? And if they get moved, where will I go? And what happens if I get moved when I happen to not be here? Where will my belongings be? And that uncertainty, um, as you can imagine, or may imagine, is really destabilizing to individuals. Our goal is to stabilize individuals, connect them with the outreach workers, um, connect them with the services they need, and get them to a place where when we have accessible, affordable housing for them, they're ready to move into that. Our whole policy around SWEET doesn't work. What it does work for is responding to a crisis from businesses or neighbors that say, there's homeless people in my park, they don't belong there, they're doing things that I don't like, I'm scared, I don't feel good about myself when I see this poverty right in front of me every day. I want my politicians to move this out of my way so I don't see it. Um, that's the problem that sweeps generally solves. But it doesn't actually solve it because all you do is move it from one neighborhood to the next and then a month later it's back in that first neighborhood. We have to find programs similar to I think what I've talked about here that work. 
But if we're going to be successful, we also have to talk about how we talk about this and how we engage with the public. One of the things I've struggled with is that the short narrative tends to play to my opponents, and the longer narrative, when I have 20 minutes debating someone on a show, I believe I can convince the majority of people listening that this is an actual rational solution, but I don't often get 20 minutes to describe it. We need help from organizations like the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty um, to put out the reports to help educate the public. We need leaders around the country to be having the longer dialogue with our communities that aren't looking for these fake solutions that have the veneer of solving something but don't actually solve it, and instead are working for long-term solutions that actually address the needs of people that are struggling in crisis and get them into the housing that a city like Seattle can afford to provide. Um, we have to change some of our rules to create the resources for that, but I know we can do that. Um, but it's a longer fight. And it's been frustrating to feel like we have an actual policy solution that will work um, and yet continue to lose that political battle. And we have a lot to learn going forward. The other thing I'll say is that um, if you're going to push this in your community, probably worth thinking about how you set up some structure and some process to engage um, hopeful allies in the conversation without necessarily proposing the solution up front. Um, you can work through a process where you say, we've tried all these other things and they don't work, and we think this is the next best thing to do. And we have some people that were formerly skeptical saying, you know what, a month ago I would have said this is not a good idea, but now I'm willing to try it. Let's see if this I believe that um, at the next iteration, whenever we do that in Seattle, that is a uh, format that I would like to see. Really appreciate the opportunity to describe what we've done here in Seattle. Um, if you'd like to talk to me more, I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to take uh, calls because I'm not here live, but you can reach out to myself and my staff, mike.obrien at seattle.gov via email, um, and we're happy to have future conversations about what we've learned and maybe what you've learned to help us be successful going forward. Thank you. Are you there? Can you say something? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. We'll move on to Carol then. Okay. Uh, apologies. Okay. So, oh, that's um, a horrible picture of me out on Skid Row, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, my clients, the Los Angeles Community Action Network, I think we're doing a, a, a protest, but um, so I am a lawyer in Los Angeles. I have been um, litigating these issues since 2000 um, when uh, um, I got contacted about doing some of the cases. I've litigated a range of cases. I think the one that people are probably most familiar with is the Jones case, which was the subject of the statement of interest by the Justice Department in the Boise, Idaho case. But I've litigated uh, a whole range. I began by litigating cases where the cities decided to, uh, and, and let me just say, I come from Los Angeles, which is the homeless capital of the United States now. Not a great distinction, but it is our distinction. Um, we were 3,000 people, unhoused people, below all of New York City in the last count, the 2017 count. We expect to be over that in, in this count. Um, and homelessness in Los Angeles is increasing by double-digit numbers. As some of you may know, we recently passed several uh, financial measures, bond measures, uh, taxes, uh, and now a linkage fee uh, to try to create money um, to, um, to uh, create housing and, and additional services for people. Um, I think all of that is terrific, uh, and I'm really pleased that the people in the city passed that, and our city council passed that. But it's uh, to be quite honest, it's, uh, it is not going to solve the problems in Los Angeles anytime soon. Uh, the goal under the two measures that passed last year were to build 10,000 units in 10 years. Los Angeles has almost that many people become unhoused in a month. Um, so it is, uh, it is not a solution to uh, the homeless crisis in Los Angeles, which is really a housing crisis, because we have no policy to protect existing low uh, income uh, housing stock. Uh, and, and we've had our heads in the sands. And just to give you an example, for those of you on the call who are from cities in Los Angeles, um, we must prepare every uh, so many years a housing element that's approved by the state. You can't get certain monies um, for housing unless you've done that. Uh, in Los Angeles, this last housing element 
it estimated that it needed 500 units a year to provide for homeless individuals. Um, that was unrealistic then. It's even more unrealistic now when you have almost 60,000 people living on the streets. Anybody can, can do the math. Um, so Los Angeles also began a program in, um, in 2006 uh, uh, called Safer Cities Initiative. Um, chief Bratton came to Los Angeles as our new police chief, and he instituted his um, uh, famous uh, Safer Cities policy uh, in Los Angeles, a uh, Safer uh, uh, Broken Windows policy, I'm sorry. Um, it did not work. All it managed to do was criminalize a lot of people for nothing more than crossing a street um, uh, on a flashing red light. We've actually now changed that law in California. Um, and um, and so we, we wound up with 12,000 citations just in the first month and just on Skid Row. Um, we have two uh, pro bono clinics in the city that represent homeless individuals in court to get rid of these um, these tickets. And uh, um, the city has reduced the uh, penalty for a lot of these uh, two infractions now but the officers have the choice still to, to uh, cite people rather than under the municipal ordinance to cite them under the state penal code, which is a misdemeanor. And as I think everybody in this call probably knows, when you accumulate those fines and penalties, they become a barrier to getting a job. They go to collections. A lot of homeless people don't show up in court. They can't get there for one reason or another. They can't navigate the system. The matters go to collections. The fines increase. Um, it becomes a barrier to getting a job. It becomes a barrier to getting services in some instance, and it's really um, counterproductive. Um, so that's another thing that we are looking at at this point. And, you know, there's been a lot of litigation post-Ferguson on these issues, but it's particularly compelling, too, for uh, homeless individuals um, and, and meeting their needs in order to work through um, these citations if, if they're even given in the first place. Um, as I said, um, you know, the, the first major case I did uh, beyond um, uh, enforcements for people standing on a sidewalk, which they have an absolute right to do, um, and, uh, and also for you know, taking people's property, uh, was the Jones case. And after the Jones case, we filed the Levan case, which also went to the Ninth Circuit, um, which basically said that because the Ninth Circuit has held that people had a right to sleep on the sidewalk at night when there is insufficient shelter in the city, they could also have their property with them. And then the third major decision for the Ninth Circuit uh, was a case called uh, Desert Rain versus uh, City of Los Angeles, which struck down the city's ban on sleeping in your vehicle. So now we have a policy where you can sleep in your vehicle, um, and, but you can't sleep in certain areas of the city. And while that might have seemed reasonable, the city has now zoned almost every area of the city as no overnight sleeping. So people are getting ticketed for sleeping in their vehicles. There certainly is no shelter. Um, and uh, this law is supposed to sunset uh, in June of 2018 um, because the city expected to have a safe parking program by then. Um, there's not a snowball's chance in Los Angeles or hell that that's going to happen. Um, so you know, we face that issue again. How do we, how do we um, uh, find housing for people? Most of what I've done, as I said, is um, litigation to stop these policies because despite having three decisions by the Ninth Circuit in this case and the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the Levan case, um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the cities have continued, all the cities around here have continued to use the same uh, uh, old, uh, unworkable challenges, uh, criminalization efforts to deal with encampments. And, and in Orange County, where I'm also litigating now, we have a different situation than Los Angeles because uh, under California law, the counties are responsible for the health and uh, support of, of low-income people, which they mostly do by general relief that does that gets you like $200 a month. Um, but um, what happens in Orange County is one city kicks people out of their city, they go to the next city, get kicked out of that or driven someplace else. Um, the shelters uh, the shelters that do exist are totally full um, and it simply becomes an unworkable situation. From the city's perspective, you know, while I understand the concerns 
that the cities have. In the end, they wind up spending a lot of money on criminalization, spending a lot of money on attorney's fees, and not being able to engage in the same kinds of tactics that they've used. Uh, it is very difficult, too, because uh, most cities, uh, there, is, there is rarely a, um, a consensus on how to deal with the problem. And so you wind up with city council members who, are, who feel there's absolutely no place in their um, uh, district where anybody could be. And I wanted to echo what Maurice said earlier, uh, people are kicked out of libraries. Libraries are one of the few places that have bathrooms that people can use. And the bathrooms are really important for the public health of everyone, but particularly for the public health of homeless people. So just one last thing I would say is, um, in addition to, you know, we, we brought the Jones case under the 8th and 14th Amendment. We brought the Levan case under the 4th and 14th Amendment. We brought the Desert Rain case under the 4th, 5th, and 14th Amendment. And we are now arguing to the court um, a state-created danger. Because in most government districts, um, the cities have known about these problems, failed to deal with them, have motions and discussions that show the awareness of the problem and still leave people out on the street, particularly, uh, I should tell you, even in Los Angeles, you can freeze, you, you can die from hypothermia uh, in the winter. Um, so uh, we've used that and, and there's a lot of good uh, case authority um, that I think will operate against uh, cities in terms of that. But it's, it's quite important to, um, to realize that criminalization is not going to get you, it's not going to solve the problem. You're not going to, you cannot police your way out of this problem. Okay. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, and again, appreciate your, your stepping up in the midst of our technical difficulties. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you now. All right. So, wow. uh, Don Sawyer is a filmmaker and an advocate who helped uh, to uh, get Indianapolis uh, to pass an ordinance protecting homeless encampments from eviction um, until adequate housing is provided. Um, as we'll hear, that, that's been a challenge to implement in practice, um, but he's going to talk a little bit about the advocacy strategies he's used and the lessons learned for others considering similar efforts. Um, and uh, Don is also working on a follow-up film um, and we encourage people to be in touch with him about that. So uh, with that introduction, uh, Don, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened in Indianapolis? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Don Sawyer. I'm producer and director of A Bigger Vision. And um, we did a, uh, uh, well, first let me talk about the, the legislation and the counselor that came before me. What, what he's emphasizing are, are the real reality of, of legislation um, is that it is it gets caught up in politics. It is definitely about politics. So how um, our legislation in Indianapolis, which is simply saying that you um, have to have the city has to have transitional or permanent housing solutions for everybody in a camp before they can sweep it. The city doesn't have to do it themselves, but they are responsible for farming it out to service providers or whatever. And if you don't have that, you can't close the camp. Um, it also has, um, I think, a two-week um, notice and have to provide storage bins and, and um, different things that are all to the benefit of the homeless campers. So... Um, that did get passed, but the drama getting it passed was definitely hooked up into politics. Um, I was surprised um, the counselor before in Seattle was saying that it was the general public that where the problem was coming from, um, you know, them saying that we can't have our kids and our families camp, but you can let these homeless people camp. That's an easy turnaround with the right messaging. Because the general public would be the bigger, the biggest ally if they saw what was happening with the homeless community. They would say, well, you know, I will sacrifice um, my right to, to uh, sleep in this camp. And 
ironically, um, Seattle has, you know, there have been more public showings of our film under the bridge in Seattle than anywhere else. Um, they're, they're really struggling up there with the, with the camp problem and, and how to approach homeless people. So, um, it, it is caught up in politics. Just a brief, um, I was approached, um, because our film was, was, um, being shown in the city, um, a political opportunity was seen by, um, the Democratic Party in town. They saw that, um, the current mayor, or the, our past mayor now, but the mayor that was in office then was vulnerable on this issue of homelessness because he was openly hostile toward homeless folks for no apparent reason, but he was. And they saw an opportunity because the election was going to be next. And so they engaged me and said um, they wanted to write some homeless legislation. They had a, um, a one seat advantage in the city county council. And they thought if they could throw a fastball legislation, put it on his desk. Um, it was also a homeless bill of rights um, and all and some um, feasibility studies for an engagement center and tiny home village. If they could just throw it on his desk, he would look bad if he signed it among his constituents. He would look um, bad and against homeless people if he didn't. So, so basically, that's that's was on on their end. It was a completely political thing. They weren't really um, focused on the people. We looked at it. We made a decision. We said, well, you know, this mayor is hostile toward homeless folks, and here's an opportunity to get something good. Our interests are diverging. So we allowed them to use our film to drum up support for um, the legislation. And so we had a lot of different showings around town, and they – you know, we, we got a pretty good following, which is another point. If you want this kind of legislation passed, you have to show support. There has to be community support or it won't, they won't pay any attention to it. So that's what we did. I told the counselor, I said, um, if this ends up being something that doesn't help homeless folks and just helps a lot of politicians with their careers, then I'd have a problem with that. And ultimately, um, it started to go that way, and then it swung back a little bit the other way. They actually tried to change the legislation to mean nothing. The, the legislation got changed to, well, if there's going to be a camp closing, you know, we'll engage everybody and we'll try real hard, but if it doesn't work, it's nobody's fault. They changed the legislation to that during this, the process, and we got them to change it back to the original form. It was um, separated out, just that and the Homeless Bill of Rights, and that went down because the mayor that I was talking about vetoed it. It was passed, but it went down. He vetoed it. But then this current mayor um, brought it back, um, the city county council, they passed it, and now it's a law. So the law now says that, that we aren't supposed to be able in Indianapolis to close a camp without um, having transitional or permanent housing for people to go. But in order to get it passed, they had to put in an emergency clause. The emergency clause was undefined other than to say biohazards or something like that. So the impl implementation got tested of this um, ordinance um, twice. First, they closed the biggest camp in Indianapolis this year called the jungle, the biggest and oldest camp. And um, they used the excuse that um, the, the camp was on private property, it wasn't on public property. And so the ordinance didn't apply and they were going to be happy with that. However, the Davidson Street closing that Maurice was talking about, they said the same thing. It's a CSX reason there, it's a CSX reason here in the jungle it was disingenuous at best. And so we put a lot of pressure on them and they tried to get through their processes, a solution for that camp. 
it fell short because there are too many agendas running that are against homeless people in Indianapolis. So basically what the ordinance, you know, the, the function that the ordinance was in that case is that it gave advocates a, a tool to, to um, challenge what was going on. Early and, and later this year, 60 people that were living in bridges downtown in Indianapolis were evicted. The emergency clause was used by the city. Um, it was a ridiculous use because they said that over in Germany or somewhere there was a terrorist bombing under a bridge and the same profile is under the bridges in Indianapolis. They could bring a, a pipe bomb or whatever and, and you know, hide it among the homeless people and the same thing could happen. Therefore, there's an emergency. We have to get these people out in three days. The reality was Comic-Con was coming that next week and the next week the Colts preseason was starting and Indianapolis has some kind of belief that the, the general public can't know there's anything, there's any homeless people in Indianapolis. So they would be coming downtown now in this season and then the basketball season. So they had to clear them out. That was clearly the reason. Then, and um, it was, came out that you can get that situation for a year. And all of a sudden now it's like a three day thing. So um, it can be misused, um, this ordinance. But what happened after that was due to those bridges, there was a lawsuit, lawsuit filed and also the head of an organization publicly challenged their, um, the city to explain themselves about this emergency clause and how their implementation of the law, all big headaches for the people who are implementing these agendas. So. If you, if you want to know whether or not this ordinance is a good thing to have, yes, it gives advocates a tool to where um, the city now has to um, consider the consequences of doing any old thing they want, any old time they want with homeless folks. So is it perfect? It's not perfect. And does it, I mean, I, I just came back from San Bernardino County, um, a conference out there, and I was amazed at the the level of collaboration that um, everywhere from city and, and government people down to advocates that are all trying hard to get on the same page to for the benefit of homeless people, and it was it was um, one of the rare times I've ever seen that 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 um those types of people business community they actually care enough to consider what's best for homeless people and if this ordinance were there then i believe it would be implemented um correctly but if you're in a community where it you know the the people are doing it just kind of for show um just to show the general public among their narrative about how they care about homeless people, look what we did to hold ourselves accountable. But there's really other agendas running that will override um, the ordinance, or you know, it's just a headache. Then you have to be as specific as you can with the um, the details in the legislation. For example, I was speaking to some somebody from a community that's considering this legislation yesterday, and and we were talking about the definition of emergency. Should it be spelled out or should it be open? Well, if you're in San Bernardino, I'd say it's probably okay to be open. If it's in Indianapolis or somewhere like that, probably needs to be more defined um, because you don't have good actors implementing the policy. But overall, the reason that it even happened was because Indianapolis developed a PR problem because Maurice's camp, the Davidson Street camp, um, was memorialized in a film and shown 
and the reputation, it was a PR problem, and they had to do something to battle that image. Um, and so, what I will also say, these types, of, this type of legislation, you have to have community support. You have to have awareness of the plight of homeless folks in your community in order to, to get um, people who control the narrative on homelessness currently to actually capitulate to doing something. That's when you're in communities that really don't care about homeless folks. In other communities, it shouldn't be as hard um, to, to get it through. It just depends on who's pow empowering your city. So, um, can you wrap it up? Now? Overall, I would, yeah, it's that's it. That's it. I got it. There it is. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, son. Um, I appreciate it, and I, I recognize that uh, uh, we are going much over time. And again, I apologize for the the technical difficulties we had earlier. Um, but I do want to give our other presenters a chance to speak. Um, uh, Nicole, uh, are are you able to say, say something? Good afternoon. I'm on the line. All right. Great. We can hear you. So uh, Nicole Martinez uh, runs the Missoula Valley Community of Hope, uh, which hosts a Camp Hope, a, a legalized encampment there. Um, and as I've said before, uh, while we at the Law Center don't particularly encourage the development of legalized encampments, um, for communities that are looking for examples of how it has been done well in the past, uh, Camp Hope is a, a place to look. Um, so with that, uh, Nicole, I've got your, your slides up. Uh, just tell me when you'd like me to advance. Great. Thank you, Eric. So the Mesilla Valley Community of Hope is a service center, and we serve people who are experiencing homelessness as a nonprofit organization in Las Cruces, New Mexico. We're the second biggest city in New Mexico. And at the, the center, we provide things like case management, housing, shelter services, uh, the program I'm going to focus on today is about uh, the encampment that we do have. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. And then that program is, is what we call Camp Hope, which is the name of our tent city. And we began Camp Hope in November of 2011. It was a response to lack of housing vouchers and having a lot of people who were experiencing homelessness sleeping on the campus of our property. And our property is owned by the city of Las Cruces. We also had a lot of people experiencing homelessness who were exposed to freezing temperatures, that were dying because of that, uh, that were vulnerable to attacks. Um, and so as a response to not having enough affordable housing, uh, we reached out to our city uh, officials to receive support to enact a, a tent city for a limited amount of time. It was supposed to be for three months. We felt that that would keep people safe and help them to transition uh, out of homelessness and uh, while they also have access to services. We have a unique situation here where we have four other social service agencies close on hand that address things like health and food, so that was very helpful for us. I believe that Don is still, there we go, <laughs> he's muted now, thank you. Um, so we did receive uh, city support to do that for a few months uh, initially and we immediately worked with the residents who were going to be at Camp Hope, uh, set up a security team, uh, registration procedures. We had the camp uh, capped at 50 people, and like Maurice said earlier, you know, people have to go somewhere while they're waiting to get into housing. Next slide, please. The next slide is just a picture of what Camp Hope looks like, and it is right behind our organization and again with a few of the other social service agencies right at hand there uh, within easy walking distance. Next slide. So briefly I want to talk about some of the challenges of uh, implementing Camp Hope. One of the uh, issues that we had is we were not zoned for allowing people to sleep on city property so we do, did have to rezone our area and uh, we did do that as a planned unit development. We worked with our city council, our planning and zoning commission, and we were able to work with our planning department at the city of Las Cruces uh, and to adhere to 
some of those conditions that we needed to meet in order to make uh, the property a, a planned unit development. We also met with our emergency officials uh, for their input on how to structure um, the camp. We did run into some issues with NIMBY, which is not in my backyard. So we're we're in an industrial zone, but we do have a few businesses that are, are in our area. And for anybody who is considering uh, this as a solution to uh, unsanctioned camps, um, you'll want to make sure that you are uh, addressing uh, people who might be in opposition to having a camp. Uh, the typical response from those who are opposing these kinds of projects uh, can in some terms be misled. Uh, in our experience, it's people who are outside of the camp, but people that don't actually have a shelter to go to, that are the ones that are most visible. Uh, but by having a camp, by having people in a, a safe and secure area, uh, it's actually a benefit to those businesses that are surrounding the area. So we made sure that we were talking to uh, the businesses around us and getting input again as we did begin to implement uh, the camp. One of the things that we also you know, talked about is what's the alternative? You know, we could also allow people experiencing homelessness to fend for themselves and sleep downtown, or, or we could provide something that was actually structured. In the funding uh, aspect, that was a challenge in the very beginning because uh, tent cities are not something that are, are funded, either federally or, or typically through state financing. So um, that was a challenge in trying to get some city support and private foundation support. Um, but we did find that that actually did um, come through for us to get the camp started. Um, and we then immediately turned our attention to the structuring uh, of the camp. And again, working closely with our city planning department, we used Bureau of Reclamation, Reclamation best practices for camping. We put in tent pad sites. We worked again with uh, emergency personnel for vehicle emergency vehicle aisles, uh, any fire precautions that we may have. We put an office, um, a portable office uh, at the camp entrance so that we were making sure that visitors were signing in and, and signing out, establishing uh, camp rules, and again, getting the input from the residents themselves, uh, making sure that we were having our, our residents register uh, as well. And then turned our attention to the actual governance uh, of the camp. And we looked to uh, several models to see what, what sort of camps had the best model. We found that those that, that were semi-autonomous, that did uh, have an aspect of self-governance were those that seemed uh, to be more successful. Uh, and so in this particular instance, we were fortunate enough to provide the organizational oversight um, and operational management, but the majority of the decision-making comes from the residents themselves and the actual day-to-day -day operations. Uh, some of the other uh, programming that we have um, for the camp residents is we have weekly uh, meetings for the camp residents. Uh, we make sure that they are providing weekly hours uh, in exchange for residency there. Um, and they also are uh, having coordinated assessments done for housing placement because we do have uh, one of the very important pieces here, uh, permanent supportive housing programs that are connected to our organization. We make sure that we're approving uh, requests uh, from any uh, operational changes at the camp, and we manage it uh, operationally, but again, day to day, the camp residents are taking on those duties. We make sure that we're using trauma-informed care when we're working with our residents there, uh, best practice models of harm reduction. We're making sure to offer the services, uh, referrals to other organizations, making sure that we, we have activities, trainings, uh, working with community partners, uh, engaging again in meetings with our, our residents, uh, discussing how to enforce the rules, um, how we are giving warnings and, and, and notices to vacate, and again, trying to use any best practice models that we can in that type of programming. And we return to the idea of camp spirit repeatedly with the residents. We've been in existence now since 2011 with just uh, the camp. And there's an ebb and flow there in the spirit and, and how, how the camp actually did start. And we feel like it's really important to underscore that camp requires participation from all, from the parent organization, which in this case is the Community of Hope, as well as from the residents themselves um, who just display an amend a tremendous amount of resiliency um, in engaging in this kind of a, an opportunity. 
Uh, we also work really hard to keep the community engaged. Um, we ask the residents to take care of each other. Um, we found that this has really developed into its own type of a community, um, whereas before it used to be each man to his own, sort of that you know, watch your back mentality. We really feel like this has been a great endeavor in uh, establishing that idea of community and help to uh, illuminate the camp spirit. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the things that we found that we we believe that we we did right in the beginning and that I would encourage others uh, to look to uh, if you are again um, looking to to enact on a, a, a tent city in your community is make sure you're asking permission try to get uh, it, it regulated and, and sanctioned um, with any of your city officials who need to play a part in that uh, we formed a safety team with the camp residents immediately we meet with them um, on a regular basis uh, we appointed uh, a camp manager, um, which we also have the camp elect um, in a democratic process. We, as an organization, were able to provide that infrastructure. We realized that that could be a barrier for a, a lot of the cities. Um, but we found that even though this wasn't a funded project, that again, we looked at what the alternative could be. Um, and, and we found that the, the pros far outweighed the cons, and especially in the uh, our ability to quickly transition our, our residents from living in tents to their own apartments. We provided that supportive services piece, the connections to the permanent supportive housing programs that we do have. Another thing I think that we do um, that, that helps with keeping the camp sustainable is having regular meetings with the camp residents. And we do that uh, at a weekly meeting. We call great conversations with the help of our facilitator uh, every Tuesday morning. And we have had about nearly 200 people using this service uh, annually. N next slide. Some of the advice that I can give to, to anyone else considering starting a sanctioned tent city is to make sure that you're reaching out to your community for support. There are a lot of people that, that want an opportunity to help. Having a camp makes homelessness very visible. Uh, utilizing your churches and your donors uh, Eagle Scouts, uh, social media, public figures, law enforcement, and especially our mental health services. Try to develop an annual fundraiser because, again, it's not something that uh, is typically fu funded. Um, what we've found, though, is an unintended consequence of having the camp, again, because it's so visible that it, it did help with uh, donations being brought into our organization. Anybody considering bringing this to the their community needs to have a way to offer services and a lifeline to housing for the residents who are at the camp. And affordable housing is, is the main reason why we have people out on the streets and that lack of housing vouchers, but you've got to get out there and find them. And while there aren't enough, make sure that we you know, are keeping our clients safe. We're putting in the time, we're meeting with the residents, listening to them. We understand and realize that tents do not end homelessness. But until we do have more affordable housing uh, and equitable housing for all, then we will continue to, to provide um, this type of safe environment for those who are uh, experiencing homelessness. And the next slide is just a few pictures of uh, the actual camp. And that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. We appreciate your expertise. Um, uh, and I've I've seen a couple of questions coming through on, on the questions chat box. Um, one, uh, all of the examples that we've shared so far, all of the ordinances that have been mentioned in Indianapolis and Seattle and elsewhere, um, those are all in the report. So uh, uh, the report's available on our website, nlchp.org, up there in the corner of your screen. Um, and a lot of the information, uh, the, there's a case study on Las Cruces and on the, the Camp Hope model um, where much more information is available in the report. So just so people know, what we're giving here is, is just a, an, an overview um, of what's available. Um, so with that, I wanna uh, turn over to our last speaker, um, uh, Sergeant Stiver or uh, Major Stiver, I, my apologies. And let me get her up on. All right. Hi, how are you doing? 
All right. Go ahead, Wendy. Go ahead. Okay. So I am the uh, commander of the Downtown Patrol Division in, in Dayton, Ohio. And Dayton, our Ohio. police department, our city, um, used or uh, implemented the Downtown Engagement Plan in 2013. And um, that project was uh, basically looking for alternative ways to manage some of our homelessness uh, issues in our city center. Um, that's where we get the most pressure from our business community. Um, here in Dayton, Ohio, we actually have um, a lot of affordable housing. In fact, we've got a, a, a bigger problem with vacant uh, housing uh, than uh, anything else. Um, but. Um, this downtown engagement project, they, uh, and this was before my time as the commander of the division, uh, they basically found a way to take the data, the information from officers when they had contacts with people in the, in the city center related to mental health and homelessness and transmit that data directly to some of our uh, social service partners so that they could go out and do their own follow-ups um, and monitor what was going on with, with some of the folks that we have regular contact with. Um, just recently, uh, I did an analysis of the arrests and citations uh, by year uh, pertaining to uh, people who carried a, an address of at large, uh, the jail or uh, shelters. And there was a, a pretty impressive 30% reduction in arrests and citations to our homeless population in a number of categories, including public intoxication and jaywalking since the implementation of that project. Um, we also know that we've seen a decrease in calls for service related to those issues uh, downtown since that project was implemented. And it basically was kind of a hands-off approach. Um, we are having less contact as police officers with some of these folks and promoting more contact with our social service partners. So I also sit on our uh, county uh, homeless solutions policy board uh, and we've, we've transmitted some of the data back to them uh, and uh, established a good relationship there. Uh, we used to have some encampments in and around the city. Uh, we don't currently but I can share an anecdote um, to kind of highlight the approach that we've been taking and, and where we see ourselves in this process. Uh, early this year, we had a, uh, a gentleman who was evicted from one of our public housing apartment complexes and took up residence under a railroad trestle downtown. I was getting a ton of pressure from our downtown business partnership and city hall to do something about this. And it's been our experience that um, people in our community, when they complain, they just want the problem to go away as quickly as possible. They're not necessarily very interested in the solution, um, as long as it's not on their front doorstep. So I was getting a lot of pressure to take enforcement action against this gentleman. And instead, what we did is we reached out to our mobile crisis we have a police officer who works full time uh, doing follow-ups on mental health issues and has very good relationships with our social service partners. In fact, they come out and they write around with her and um, they work on these issues together. So I, I reached out to our mobile crisis officer and um, the, one of the challenges here is that this gentleman absolutely refused uh, to accept any kind of emergency or temporary housing, um, he refused to do anything but go back to where he had been living before. And we attempted to negotiate with the public housing director uh, to try to get him back in, but because he fought them during his eviction, they absolutely were not going to let him back in for three years. Um, and, you know, this problem of homelessness is complicated by the fact that not everybody necessarily want the resources that we're offering them. Uh, and so um, when they refuse the assistance and they're still there, people often then turn around and put pressure on the police. In this case, 
our mobile crisis officer because we I took the heat from the from City Hall um, while she went out and actually tracked down this guy's family members. I found some family members and brought them down to talk to him and convince him to accept the housing resource, uh, which he did, and we haven't seen him since. Um, and you know, had we approached this with citations and arrests, we'd still be out there dealing with it. We would still be out there. Uh, periodically having to cite him, drag him off to jail, and then deal with his possession, which he had um, kind of a growing uh, one-man camp there under the railroad hustle, and he was starting to invite friends over. Uh, so by being proactive and by taking that different approach, I think that we, um, we, we did a better job of more effectively resolving the issue, um, and, you know, we, we – we're very careful of um, protecting his rights in addition to the rights of the community. And, um, and our officers were safer as a result. Uh, they were not put into a position where they had to take an enforcement action uh, that could involve some kind of force or you know, refusal or resistance to uh, the arrest. And, and so it was a win-win for us. Um, now again, we don't have large encampments and um, you know, and I, I think that as long as we continue this approach, we, we probably won't. But it's very, very critical that um, we get support that law enforcement, if they're willing to try alternative approaches, uh, approaches that they get support from city leaders uh, and from social service partners. When we pick up the phone and call and, and ask for assistance with a problem like this, um, we absolutely have to have that support because on the other side of the phone is that pressure from the community to take enforcement action. So the other thing uh, real quick is, and I believe Carol brought this up, um, the issue of bathrooms. Uh, that is absolutely um, a huge issue and it's an issue for law enforcement as well. Uh, we have been very blessed with um, increased and economic development in our downtown and decreases in crime. And so I spend a lot of time dealing with panhandling, parking, and public urinating. And um, it appears to me as though at some point in the past, a lot of public bathrooms were removed and probably to prevent uh, homeless people from using them in, in public spaces. Um, and so now the greater issue is that um, we have parking garages and some public places where there's a lot of uh, complaints about public urinating. And so I've had some conversations with some of our downtown business leaders about um, trying to create or build a, uh, a public restroom um, that would hopefully um, help to prevent or reduce the problem of, of public urinating and I've gotten a lot of resistance to it. Um, and especially here in Dayton, Ohio, where we've got a huge problem with the opiate epidemic, there's a lot of fears that if we create a public uh, restroom space, that it will just be a place for people to overdose on uh, heroin. Um, I've seen some models in other cities, in particular Asheville, North Carolina, has a public restroom very close to their police facility um, that's uh, monitored. Um, you know, but we, we don't have it, and, um, and that's, that's a huge issue um, that, um, you know, we, we have to address, because if we don't provide something, um, then we have other problems. So Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say that's about it. Uh, no, we appreciate it, and we appreciate that, uh, you know, as a, a law enforcement officer, you recognize the important role that law enforcement has to play, but that uh, you know these are public health issues, and uh, the <laughs> public health uh, should be you know in many ways the lead um, in in this area, um, and uh, and that's an important partnership to have. Uh, Major Cyber uh, comes to us through her work with um, a national group, the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, and I think. Um, 
you know, she was saying partnership is, is definitely the name of the game, having the different city agencies and officials working together on common solutions. Um, so recognizing that we are uh, already well over time, um, I'm going to just quickly wrap up here. Um, wanted to uh, mention that uh, now that we've defined the problem and, and talked about some of the tools, uh, again, many more of them are available in our, uh, our report. Um, things that you can do uh, first are join our campaign for Housing Not Handcuffs by going to housingnothandcuffs.org and clicking, clicking on the endorsement link. Um, with uh, that, we'll keep you up to date on the latest news regarding communities who are fighting against criminalization and implementing housing and other constructive alternatives. Um, and indeed, um, if you're interested in endorsing, um, this is the endorsement statement. Um, uh, we can follow up and we'll send the link directly out after uh, the, uh, the, the webinar, uh, along with the recording of the webinar. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, hopefully, if uh, at least that part of the technology has worked and we should be posting it in a day or two. We, we can also make the slides available. I know people have been asking about that. Um, additionally, you can speak out in your community. Um, on our Housing Not Handcuffs website, we have uh, uh, a number of uh, messaging tips on how to talk about uh, criminalization of houses, homelessness, and um, housing in the community, um, and it's there. Uh, you can use it uh, in testimonies, in op-eds, um, in wherever you are, uh, whatever the need is. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, you can partner with us to help bring constructive solutions to your communities. We have many other resources available on our website, and we are happy to work with you uh, to help uh, take some of the solutions and the good solutions that have been described today and that are further described in our reports and uh, make them part of uh, our communities. Um, so just given that we have um, gone so far over time, um, I think I'm uh, going to uh, let everybody go. Uh, thank you for bearing with us um, on the questions and answers. We do have all of the questions that have been asked in the text box recorded, um, and we have uh, who asked them. Uh, so. If, uh, if you have, it, have asked the question, um, we will follow up with you afterwards and try and get you specific answers to your questions. Um, any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, uh, my contact information is here um, on the screen. Uh, please download the report, share the report um, widely. We hope to um, use this as a means of taking our communities and bringing them to a better place, um, I, again, we don't encourage encampments as a permanent solution, but we think that uh, communities can take steps to ensure that everybody has a safe place to sleep and exist tonight as they build the permanent solutions for the long term. So thank you uh, again for bearing with us. Um, all this information will go out. We'll send out a follow-up uh, email afterwards with links to the report, with links to the, the online recordings, uh, with links to the slides, and et cetera. Um, thank you to our presenters um, who brought a tremendous amount of expertise to this, um, and we look forward to continuing conversation with everybody. Thank you.